Okay, guys, in our last unit, we're going to cover diabetes, um, or diabetes, as uh, said by Wilfred Brimley, uh, the kind of well-known advocate for uh, diabetic care, uh, rest in peace. So um, just some perspective, this is data from 2012, but uh, these numbers have likely increased, um, but estimates of uh, diabetes in America in terms of costs, $245 billion direct and indirect, direct medical costs, 176 indirect cost. You know, there we're in the tens of millions of individuals with type 2 diabetes. It's a big problem in the United States, especially, you know, um, we can see this kind of coming in concert with what we see with obesity and other cardiometabolic conditions. Um, this would be no surprise that obesity is also, um, diabetes is also a concern as obesity has increased. So uh, just a quick review of the physiology, again, in diabetes, the hyperglycemic state results in glycation of tissues, which causes a, a plethora of abnormalities. We see endothelial dysfunction. Um, we see changes in the vascular smooth muscle. We see um, this leading to propensity of thrombosis and clot formation. It contributes to atherosclerosis due to the endothelial dysfunction. Um, you know, we obviously see reductions in endothelium-derived nitric oxide. We kind of talked about that in the obesity lecture, which kind of comes in concert, you know, those changes in the perivascular adipose tissue coming in concert with metabolic um, changes and how that affects insulin signaling. Um, so, you know, obese individuals have issues with uh, vessel resistance and thus blood pressure, as well as a high risk for developing blood clots due to the um, you know, increased activation of platelets, increased production, production of coagulation factors, um, and inhibited pathways for fibrolysis. Um, so uh, there are a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of complications here um, related to, um, to diabetes. It's elevation in um, blood glucose. And uh, I like this little diagram here. It kind of describes all the different changes that we see here, right? So diabetes you know, leading the, you know, or which can, can, can be released as hyperglycemia, insulin resistance, they're all related to each other. Uh, no matter how you break it down, it's going to lead to vasoconstriction, inflammation, and thrombosis, um, which is going to set the stage for all those pathological changes in tissue. Now, um, insulin resistance, we touched on this a little bit in the obesity lecture, right? So at physiological levels, Insulin regulates vascular homeostasis by maintaining a balance of endothelial-derived nitric oxide and endothelin-1. Remembering nitric oxide, vasodilator, endothelin-1, vasoconstrictor. When we eat, right, insulin is released, right, which normally acts as a vasodilator, right? Again, at the muscle level, especially, um, which, again, our skeletal muscle, think of them as the, the sink for blood glucose. And this is achieved through an activation of P13K um, receptor, which increases expression and bioavailability of nitric oxide. It also activates AMPK, which is another enzyme, which increases ET1. Um, but in a normal situation, normal body composition, normal, you know, normal blood glucose, uh, control normal insulin signaling. This balance is maintained, which favors um, nitric oxide, right, this pathway over this uh, pathway. Now, in patients with insulin resistance, right, um, where they are producing insulin, it's released when they eat, it's just not sensitive anymore. It's just not, it, it, it's not, you know, it's not doing its job. It's not, the function of insulin is impaired. This relationship between P13K or PI3K um, is selectively reduced. It's a paradoxical relationship. We see this pathway reduced, reduced, and this pathway left unopposed. So we have unopposed vasoconstriction and reduced vasodilation. And remember, endothelin one in addition to being a vasoconstrictor, has other serious, you know, uh, changes or effects on vascular health, platelet aggregation, endothelial function overall, uh, microvascular tone, right? It, it's a big problem here. And it's, it goes back to this balance. Now, we could touch on glute 4 receptors as well, but you know, the, the role of insulin 
why insulin resistance is such a problem is that we lose that inability to uptake glucose. So often in patients with diabetes, we see insulin levels super high. Your body just tries to secrete more and more of it. The, 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 the receptors are no longer sensitive to it. Um, and blood glucose stays elevated. Everything's up, nothing's working. And we think exercise training can play a role here in tr trying to bring this back to balance. And actually, this should be not AMPK, uh, it should be AMGPK. Sorry about that, and that should be a one. You had that correct there. All right, not super important, but just remembering the, the pathways here. So again, this is kind of a breakdown of what we see here. So hyperglycemia, again, we see this, um, you know, there's a lot, of different, a lot of different mechanisms involved here. PKC activation, glucose oxidation, um, these act, advanced glycogen, or glycation end products, we'll talk about them in a second, poly, polyol pathway. Um, we see this increased oxidative stress. Oxidative stress uncouples um, you know, the enzymes in, the en in endothelium leading to endothelial dysfunction. So again, hyperglycemia leads to a lot of pathological changes that ultimately lead to increased oxidative stress leading to endothelial dysfunction when our endothelial cells become dysfunctional or activated. They are no longer, you know, they don't have those same properties of producing a lot of nitric oxide, maintaining vascular homeostasis, and having those um, antithrombotic properties, and we start seeing blood clots. We start seeing poor perfusion to tissue. And that's why a lot of diabetics have problems with, you know, with perfusion, and you know, they end up having issues with um, wound healing. Now again, these advanced glycation end products are ages, or age, um, also known as glycotoxins. I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we refer to these as age or ages in plural, but these are called glycotoxins. These are highly oxidant compounds um, that are, we think are play that significant role in all the, 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 the damage that occurs in tissues. Uh, basically, this occurs through a non-enzymatic reaction between sugars and free amino acids in the blood. Um, and that creates, again, these really, really reactive, highly oxidating tissues that cause profound damage. Um, and again, we think this is responsible for all the pathological changes or primary driver, this you know, increased reactive oxygen species or oxy leading to oxidative stress, increased uh, arterial stiffness, impaired wound healing, increase in blood pressure, retinopathy, and neuropathy. And we think it has to do with, again, we, we lose the ability to uptake glucose into the muscle, especially after eating. Blood glucose stays elevated. Again, we want blood glucose after we eat, goes into our bloodstream to go into our cells to be stored. Patients with diabetes, they lose that ability and that glucose stays in the blood. It goes through this non-enzymatic um, reaction, leading to the production of these advanced glycation end products, causing damage throughout the body. So, Again, diabetes and metabolic disease would get when the body's inability to produce an, either enough insulin, which is type 1 diabetes, or they lose the sensitivity to insulin. So again, either way, they, they don't have enough insulin, type 1 or type 2. They just don't produce, uh, or the insulin is no longer sensitive. That pathway is no longer sensitive, and we can't take in glucose from the bloodstream into the cells. Um, we see an elevated um, plasma glucose um, in these patients. Now, probably the, the way for us to, uh, you know, probably one of the more uh, functional tests for patients for, uh, for diabetes, uh, they'll be given an oral glucose tolerance test. We find this is actually a little bit more um, better or better than as a, rec as a diagnostic test. There can be a lot of different reasons why someone's fasting blood glucose could be elevated. An oral glucose tolerance test will let us see, like, functionally, how well is our glucose homeostasis regulatory systems, right? Like how, how well are, are they able to actually handle a bolus of glucose? Like how well are these regulatory systems functioning under stress when they're supposed to do their job? Um, you may also see patients um, with diabetes tracked using their uh, hemoglobin A1C, which is a way for us to see how, um, how well their blood glucose is controlled. This is basically a measure of how many hemoglobin are glycated. Um, so again, if you've got a lot of blood sugar in your blood, or a lot of, sorry, a lot of glucose in your blood, the hemoglobin, your red blood cells, really all cells, but especially your hemoglobin, are going to be glycated. 
the more of these that are glycated, meaning you've got more blood glucose chronically elevated in your bloodstream, um, right? That, you know, the higher this is, the more, the poorer your glucose control is. And typically we say it's anyone with a hemoglobin A1C of six and a half or higher. Um, you know, we, we want this typically, um, you know, below four ish, right? We don't, we don't want this super high. Um, now in a normal, um, patient, right? If we give them a bolus of glucose, this is the OGTT, right? You know, you give a normal person a bolus of glucose, their blood sugar increases. And over time, again, you got this regulatory system, things will go down. It goes back to that basal level after we eat, right? You know, we, we eat it, goes in our bloodstream, all those systems, you know, we have GLUT4, insulin uptakes things in the muscle, which is our biggest sink, we're good to go. Some of the diabetic, they typically stay elevated, even just at rest. We give them blood glu- uh, a bolus of glucose. Blood glucose stays elevated, um, you know, much longer period until it comes back down. So again, um, the big issue is they don't have the regulatory systems to, you know, control um, blood blood glucose when we have you know an uptake of food and it's already typically elevated. It's either due to again not enough insulin um, you know, or no production of insulin or the sensitivity of insulin is, is reduced. And again, just an example of kind of what we see here. Again, the spike, you know, um, and then a very prolonged reduction. Um, in, uh, sorry, so this is our, our, our glucose map here again. So spike, much longer uh, reduction, 